come and lead us in our first hymn. Oh, good evening, everyone. And stand with me, if you would, please, and turn to hymn number 124. 124, Kneel at the Cross. And we're going to sing all three stanzas. And I need to hear some. You ready? Oh, hold on. There we go. <laughs> evening let's pray together for prayer and brother kurt michael lead us in prayer tonight if you would please Amen. Amen. Please be seated, if you would. And I don't know if you noticed on the way in today, but we just, uh, Brother Joel, created some mountains today. We got the uh, the top layer of the topsoil cleared off on most of the, the new parking lot. And uh, and the reason we piled it all up was because if we kind of spread it out right now, there's no grass growing. The rain comes down and gets kind of washed away. So we just kind of piled it up there. We're going to wait the spring. And then we'll landscape it all out, and we'll get the seeds sown, and then we'll get the grass coming up, and that'll look a lot nicer. But, uh, of course, it's going to rain tomorrow, so, uh, but once we get a little bit more dry weather, then the gravel will go in, and it'll start taking shape, all right? So that's what's going on right now. Amen. All right, well, let's, uh, let me see our announcements. Go ahead, brother. You have your bulletins. I will highlight some announcements. If you do not have a bulletin, just slip your hand up, and an usher will bring you one. Uh, this evening we'll be continuing our Prophecy in the News series with the Mysteries of the Kingdom. So, and then Jam Club will meet immediately following the song service this evening. Birthdays this week that haven't passed. Uh, Miss Bella, and she's not here, but or I don't see her if she's here. Okay, I lost her. Sorry, Bella. <laughs> uh, but uh, her birthday is today, so happy birthday, Bella. I still haven't found you, but I'm told you're here, so happy birthday. I tried to catch you coming in. 
And then uh, coming events uh, on this Sunday, we'll be having a memorial service for uh, Brother Wayne Warner so, uh, during the evening service. So, uh, And then next Thursday, not tomorrow, but next Thursday, January 19th, we will resume McMinnville School of the Bible. So make sure uh, if you're signed up for that, that you've paid your dues and all, all those good things and do have that on your calendar. And then uh, coming up on Sunday, January the 29th, we'll be observing the Lord's, serv- uh, the Lord's Supper during the morning service. And then after the evening service on the 29th as well, we'll be having our annual business meeting. So do keep those things in mind. This evening, as we give on to the Lord uh, tonight, and we do appreciate uh, those who will uh, be remembering Brother Wayne Warner this coming Sunday. And be an encouragement to the family. Special memorial service this Sunday night. All right. Good to have Brother Justin with us. <laughs> We're just glad to hear, brother. Go ahead and pray for our offering, please. Amen. 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 books out one more time. Turn with me to hymn number 55. Oh, there have been names that I have loved to hear, but never have there been a name so dear. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. We're going to sing all three stanzas. Hymn number 55.
it's time for Jam Club. And then we'll come to our prayer time this evening. And it's Bella's birthday today. He mentioned you, but you're right saying. And it's your birthday today. Fifteen she is. So happy birthday, Miss Bella. Lord bless you. That's great. And your, your mommy's recruiting people, students for the Bible school. That's wonderful. That's great. We're glad to see that. Okay. Well, let's have our time of prayer this evening. Uh, because the way the Bible study's been going. Uh, too long. But, uh, but hopefully it doesn't seem too long. I kind of get kind of lost in the message, you know. So um, uh, let me just uh, see if we can have um, people pray. Brother Joe, if you would pray for us tonight. And Brother Joel, Joel and Joel. We're working Joel hard today. He's been on that track right there for eight hours. Now we're going to get him to pray. So Brother Joel will lead in prayer and Brother Joel will finish in prayer. And uh, I just want to mention, especially actually Miss, Miss Hannah's sister, uh, she has surgery for a brain tumour, which is very, a very, very serious surgery. And she lives up in, is it Louisville? Up that way? Louisville, Kentucky? Oh, okay. She's going for the surgery in Louisville. So her name is Esther Taylor. She's on the bulletin there. And uh, I think she's just waiting for, to be called in for that surgery. So would you remember Esther very especially tonight in prayer that the Lord will, will help and undertake for that surgery and all will go well. And pray for Hannah because I think she's going to go up to try to take care of her a little bit uh, during that as well. And then we're glad to have Miss Connie with us tonight. And uh, she's having some health issues. Of course, uh, Brother Robert is too. But pray for especially for Connie tonight. And uh, she fell this morning. That's why she's sitting on that pillow back there. But uh, pray that the Lord will help her with her health issues as well. Okay, um, uh, Miss Faye Hargis, she's she was uh, quite weak apparently on Sunday, so pray for for uh, for Faye, and of course all of our shut-ins for Dan and Wilma. Let's not forget these ones uh, and others as well. Anything else you'd like to add for prayer this evening? Yes, brother. Oh. Davenport, Todd, and Christy. Okay, remember the family um, from Smithville uh, for Karen, especially. Uh, she wasn't here; they weren't here on Sunday, and not here tonight. So sometimes they have physical issues. So pray for Karen especially, and for Kat and for Zach. All right. Anything else then? All right, let's pray, especially uh, remember our missionaries in prayer. Um, pray also for all of the, the work that's going to go on this year on the building. And I'm sure we'll be running into all kinds of issues and problems as we go, go on with that. That's, that's just the way it is. Uh, but pray especially for the work we're doing right now, that we'll get the weather at the right time, and we'll get, be able to get this work done, and the result will be good. Okay. All right, Brother Joe, if you lead us, please. Actually, it's a good thing because people are at home watching and they can't hear us. So, Brother Joe, <laughs> he's in his he's in his dunger. He's <laughs> just come on, brother, when you're out of here. Let's take it to the Lord in prayer tonight. Now, dear Heavenly Father, you've certainly heard the request that has been made from Pastor and from others. And Lord, each need, each situation, Lord, needs your divine attention tonight. And Father, we know that we're not uh, just, Lord, letting you know something you don't know. But Lord, you want us to know that we know who to go to in times like these. And we do come to you in prayer tonight, believing, Lord, that you're able to do that exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. Uh, Lord, where there's been surgeries and very difficult and dangerous surgeries have been done, where there's sicknesses going on, Father, tonight we know you are the great physician. And Father, for those tonight who can't be with us because of situations beyond their control, we ask you to be with them and encourage their hearts tonight uh, as they 
may be listening to this service tonight, I pray you be with Pastor again as he deeps deep into your word, Lord, to give us the truth uh, of your precious word tonight as he always does. And Father, just be with our church family now as so many families are going through testings and trials and difficulties. And uh, Father, I just have been reminded just towards the end of this year, as I know myself, even last year, Lord, when so much was going on in the political realm and the, and the other areas, uh, how we can get our eyes off the Lord and, Father, look on those things and get very discouraged or defeated. But Lord James reminded us that, you know, when all these trials and tests has come, uh, just count it all joy. And, uh, Lord, that God's working in our hearts and lives. I don't always understand what he's doing, but I know he's doing and though it's for our good and for his glory. And Father, tonight we do pray for our Lord, uh, this world we're living in. Lord, we pray that uh, we'll see a turnaround. We'll see, Lord, an awakening in the hearts and lives of your children, counting me. And Father, this may be the greatest year that Calvary Baptist Church has experienced coming into it. Lord, you, you blessed us greatly in 2022. Lord, no matter what went on around us, Lord, you were still on the throne. You were still blessing. We thank you for that. Now, Father, as we look on the property now, which is our goal this year, uh, Lord, with your help and guidance and direction and provision, Lord, uh, to see a building sitting on that property for this year's out, Lord, and it might not be finished, and Lord, we don't know how it's going to happen, but Lord, we know you can do that. That's, that's your building, Lord. It's you're going to be your church to, to house the preaching of your word and God's people. So we thank you for your help already and what you're going to be doing and what you are doing now behind the scenes now. Thank you, Lord, for our family here, the church family. I appreciate so much my personal self, Lord. I appreciate all the folks who've shown care and concern for me and just minor, minor things and have been there for me. And I know we're there for each other. And, Lord, you can't have put a price on friendship. And we thank you for that tonight. So bless us, Lord. Keep your hand upon us. Guide our life. Guide our direction. In Jesus' name we'd ask it. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight. We pray, Lord, for each of those uh, at the church here who uh, have ailments and sickness. Lord, we pray that you might uh, touch each one and answer prayers and work in each life. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, you might uh, uh, bless Brother Joe and his uh, his leg that he might. Uh, the doctors might figure out what's going on there and, and uh, that you might heal him. And uh, Lord, pray for Esther as she's facing this surgery and ask that your will might be done and everything would be successful and the, that uh, your, uh, your hand might be on the surgeons and give them wisdom and, and uh, bless Hannah as she travels up there to be with her. And, Lord, pray now that uh, you might continue to bless the the building project. We thank you, Lord, that the permits and everything have come through, and they were able to get started there. And, uh, praise you for that, and just pray that uh, you might have your will and your way all the way through, and uh, that much might be accomplished uh, for you, and that souls might be saved as a result of the, of the larger church building. And, just pray that you might bless the services tonight and uh, give us what we need to hear and bless Brother Tom and give uh, give him just what we need uh, from your word tonight. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles, please. And I can find my notes. Does everyone have notes okay? Uh, we're going to go, first of all, to Matthew 13. And we'll be going other places after that. Matthew chapter 13. We have been considering in our study on prophecy. Uh, we're going to be looking at prophecy in the news. We're going to be looking at uh, different things that are taking place right now in the land of Israel. Uh, the different nations around the world. But you know, in order for you to be able to slot in what's happening on the news. And you have to have a context. And that's really what we're doing with these prophecy essentials. We're trying to kneel down 
you know, what really is important, what really uh, defines for us what's going to take place in the future, um, that, it's, that this is not the kingdom we're in right now, uh, God is not through with the nation of Israel. These are important truths, and so we're setting a context so that we'll be able to um, look at what's going to take place in the future uh, in this proper context. So we have looked at some of these essentials. Uh, Israel and the church are different. Uh, prophetic scripture should be interpreted literally. When you do that, then the church is different than Israel. And God's promises to Israel will be fulfilled literally as they were given. Uh, understanding prophetic gaps. We looked at that um, in detail. And then uh, the nature of the kingdom, that it is a political kingdom. It's not just a spiritual, it is a spiritual kingdom. You have to be saved to get into that kingdom. But it is a kingdom on the earth, rule and reign from Jerusalem. Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. Uh, we looked at the characteristics of the kingdom. Uh, some of the things that are distinctive, that are not true today. One of those things, of course, is Satan is bound. Uh, many wonderful things uh, about the kingdom. And uh, those promises will be fulfilled. Uh, I got my font sorted out from last time. So understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven is, I think, a very interesting study. And that's what we're doing right now. Now, we introduced this study. Didn't get into any of the parables last time. Uh, but we will tonight. Uh, we're going to be looking at the first parable, the parable of the sower this evening. But I want to do a little bit of review because it's really, really important, the context of these parables. So if you look at your notes there, uh, Jesus predicts his exile up until, up until mm, about Matthew chapter 12. Jesus is presenting himself as the king of Israel, as the son of David. As the son of David, he is the king of Israel. Uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But as time went on, uh, it was becoming very clear that the, uh, the leaders and the people of Israel were not ready for their king. In fact, he came unto his own. And his own received him not. And so in chapter 13 and onward, he is now preparing his disciples for the postponement of this kingdom. And that it's not going to happen until he goes away first. And then he will return again. Um, if you look at Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 and 2, we mentioned this briefly last time. There's a, there's a, there's a symbolic thing that takes place here in these verses the same, day Jesus, the same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the sea, saying, this is in Capernaum. And the, in chapter 12 here, uh, the Jews had, and the leaders, the Pharisees and so on, had attributed his power of his miracles to that of Satan. And this was the unpardonable sin. This was, there was no coming back from this. Uh, and this was the nail in their coffin. And from that time on, uh, it's kind of symbolic. The house would re represent Israel. And even in chapter 12 from verse 46 on, speaking about his own family, and he says, Who is my mother and my brethren, but these that do the will of God. And uh, the sea in Scripture, especially in the book of the Revelation, is always speaking about the nations, the Gentile nations of the earth. So Jesus went out of the house, and he sat by the seaside. Great multitudes were gathered to gather unto him, so that uh, he went into a ship, and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So not only does he leave the house, sits on the seashore, um, but the multitude's gathered. So he gets, he leaves the seashore, steps onto a boat, and the boat goes out a little bit for him to be able to speak to them. So it's, it's some people might not see it, but that's sort of symbolic of what's going on here because he's, he's leaving now this first uh, task, as it were, coming as the son of David, presenting himself as the king of Israel. He's been rejected. And so now he's going to go to the Gentiles. He's, um, he's, his mission is, is, is going to be much broader. He came unto his own, his own received him not. Uh, but as many as received him, to them could be part of become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So the ship speaks of his departure from the house to the sea, from Israel to the Gentiles. Now in so doing, he's going to uh, predict what the world will be like uh, in the time of his exile. Jesus is preparing his disciples now for his crucifixion. From that time on, he begins to tell them what's going to happen, what's going to, happen to him. They don't, they don't understand it. They don't get it. But I want you to look at Luke chapter 19. This is another very, very important parable that illustrates for us what's going on here. Um, something the disciples were not 
uh, conscious of. They thought Jesus is here. He's going to be he who redeems Israel. He's the king of Israel. And he's going to bring the kingdom to Israel. And of course he will. And he is the king. And he will bring the kingdom. But not until people receive him. And Israel receives him. And that will be at the second coming. So in Luke chapter 19. And the, the context of Luke 19 is. This is when he's going to Jerusalem to be crucified. And uh, that's, you know, you can pick it up in chapter 18. Uh, that's where blind Bartimaeus, when he's coming to Jericho, you know, they would come from Galilee down through the Jordan uh, Valley, uh, usually on the eastern side of the Jordan River. They would cross over. They would come by Jericho, come up the Jericho Road. They would pass uh, Bethany um, and uh, uh, some other villages there, come over the Mount of Olives, down through the Kidron Valley, and then through the eastern gate of Jerusalem. And so as he's on his way, blind Bartimaeus, in chapter 18, verse 38, he cried, saying, Jesus, thy son of David, have mercy on me. And we mentioned that that's, that was no idle word. He was acknowledging that Jesus Christ was the king of Israel at that point. And Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, Lord, I want you to heal me of my blindness. He must have had some great faith. He must have truly believed who the Lord was. Because he's, he's saying, Lord, you can heal me of my blindness. And of course, in verse 42, Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith hath saved thee. It's interesting all through the scriptures, it's always, safe, it's always faith that is the trigger. And then he comes into Jericho. Uh, he's coming through Jericho, comes out the other end of Jericho, and there's a guy up a tree. His name's Zacchaeus. And, uh, and so he, Zacchaeus gets saved. And then as you continue on in verse number 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. Now watch this. Because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So he's now on the other side of Jericho. He's going up the Jericho road as he gives them this parable. And the reason he tells them this parable is because they're near to Jerusalem. And the disciples and everybody that's following, Blind Bartimaeus is one of them, by the way. You can imagine how excited he was. But they're going to Jerusalem. They think, you know, this is, this is it. This is Passover. And, of course, uh, this would be the triumphal entry. I believe that happens um, on the first day of the week, on, in the, uh, sorry, on, on the Saturday night, and the evening of the first day of the week, um, when he comes in the evening time, and he comes down riding upon the donkey. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And this is really his, his official presentation to Israel. Now he knows it's going to happen. But when he came and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's his, and you know, Zechariah 9, 9, Behold thy king cometh unto thee, lowly in heaven, um, uh, uh, humility and riding upon the, the foal of an ass. Um, so that's his official presentation to Jerusalem, to Israel as their king. And, of course, they refuse him. Five days later, they've got him on the cross. So he's telling them this story because he's helping them, trying to, to help them to understand that the kingdom, of God is not, the kingdom of heaven is not coming right now. Because he was near to Jerusalem, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. And he said unto them, a certain nobleman went into a far country. Now, all through the study, I've been talking about the far country. Joseph was rejected, goes into the far country. Moses is rejected, goes into the far country. And several of these parables uh, are, are based on that. And of course, it's the nobleman, he's speaking about himself and how that he is refused and he's going to take a journey. He's going to go into the far country. Now, how long has it been? How long has Jesus been in exile, in a sense? How long has he been in the far country? 2,000 years. I want you to notice something interesting. Look over at chapter 20. In verse 9, then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And that's not the only parable. Uh, there's, there's others that say that. So, you know, up, you know, the apostles were expecting Christ to come in their lifetime, you know. Uh, but when we look at 2,000 years, it's been a long time. But Jesus knew it'd be a long time. And in these parables, he told us he'd been in the far country for a long time, and it has been a long time. And it's, we're hoping that the time is short, that he's coming back now. All right, so let's look at the parable. A certain, man, a certain nobleman went into a far country 
and to receive for himself a kingdom in return. Now, I want you to notice that he goes into the far country and then he receives the kingdom in the far country and then he returns with the kingdom. So how is this the kingdom now if Jesus has to go to the far country to receive that kingdom and then to return? The kingdom that is prophesied in the Old Testament is not here yet. The characteristics don't match. And what he's telling us uh, in Matthew 13 is what to expect when he's gone. Okay, so here's what he says in this part of the verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. The word occupy means to do business. Can you do something with this microphone? It's, a little, it's ringing or something. It's a little too loud. Turn this one down a wee bit, if you wouldn't mind. Um, occupy till I come. So he's, he's saying that he's going to go to the far country, going to receive a kingdom, then he's going to come back again. Now, what do you do as, servant, as servants? While the master's away, you occupy, you do business, you stay busy till he comes. Verse 14, but his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Similar words are said of Moses. They said, who do you think you are? You're, who sent you to be a ruler and a judge over us? And they rejected Moses. It came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, see, he receives the kingdom, then he returns with the kingdom. When he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. Okay, so he, this, now this particular parable, there's other parables where he gives five pounds, and uh, ten pounds, five pounds, one pound. This one here, he just gives one pound to everybody. And so this first one has invested. This one pound has gained interest. And uh, we've produced uh, 10 pounds because of that. And so uh, in verse 16, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. Verse 17, he said unto him, Well, thy good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thy authority over 10 cities. Okay. So the master's returned. His servants have been diligent. They've done good. Uh, they're, they're, they're stewards, so therefore they have to give a report to the master of what, what has happened. And he now commends those who have occupied and who have done well. And because they were faithful, well done thy good and faithful servant. What is the most important thing God is looking for? Faithfulness. Okay. And he says, have thy authority over ten cities. Let me ask you something. Are there cities in heaven? There is one city in heaven. Heaven is a city, the new Jerusalem, described for us in Revelation chapter 21. This, these cities that he's speaking about are not in heaven. These cities, he came from heaven to back to the earth, right? So where would you expect the cities to be? Here, in the kingdom. And what, what he's basically teaching here is that um, our faithfulness in this time in which we live will have a great bearing upon what's going to happen in the kingdom. Um, the Bible says that believers will be rewarded for their faithfulness and rewarded for their service. Well, what would that reward be? Well, crowns. But it's beyond that. Uh, it's responsibilities and things that we will delight in, in the kingdom. And so here's authority over 10 cities because this guy had been faithful to the Lord. Now, we're not going to read all of this, but if you go back up to uh, verse 26, uh, let's see, verse 27. Um, of course, you get the one steward who just, he, you know, he hid the, the, the pound in the, in, the, in the earth and it didn't gain anything. Uh, it was like he, he never lived and he, was, he had no reward whatsoever. But then he says in verse 27, but those mine enemies, now this is after he comes back and he rewards his faithful servants, but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, that's the ones he's spoken about there in verse 14, but his citizens hated him, sent the message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. He says in verse 27, but those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them. So he's speaking about reigning, that's, that's speaking of kingdom, that's speaking of him as a king. And, but as citizens would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. That's pretty serious stuff. But the second common is very, very serious. And it's not just uh, uh, rebellious Jews that will be judged. And, uh, you know, at the end of the tribulation, all of Israel believe uh, the unbelieving Jews are, are judged and, and, and killed at the second common. 
But that's also true of all unbelievers who have received the mark of the beast. Not all unbelievers received the mark of the beast. Um, there are those who did not, and they would be the, uh, the, the nations that are brought before him in Matthew 25, where he separates the sheep from the goats. So they're saved people, saved Gentiles, and they're on saved Gentiles that will be judged um, at the second coming as well. But the point we're making is this gap, okay, this gap that we looked at uh, here um, in this, this timeline, which is what we're looking at right here from the time of his rejection, which is even before the cross, until the time of his receiving by Israel at the second coming. That's the time period that he's describing in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, that's what he's calling the mysteries of the kingdom. And of course, we, uh, we give you that one there as well. That's on your notes for, for, for last time. So let's go ahead and go back to our notes then. So Jesus predicts his exile. He's predicting this period of time, this gap, when the kingdom is postponed. When everything is on hold, while he's in the far country, really an exile, they, didn't, they refused him. So he had to leave for a period of time, just as Joseph was refused by his brothers. And he ended up in the far country for 22 years. And then at the second time, his brothers believed upon him. And while in the far country, he, he married a Gentile bride, Moses. Uh, suppose that his brethren would have understood that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And so Moses had to go into the far country, the, Mid uh, the Midian, uh, for 40 years. There he married a Gentile bride, Zipporah. And then the second time at the burning bush, he came back with signs and wonders. And at that time, Israel believed, and both Moses and Joseph became the saviour of Israel, the deliverer of the, the Jewish people. And that will also be true with Jesus. He's in the far country. What's he doing? Being married unto a Gentile bride primarily. When he comes again, he will be received by Israel and will be their deliverer from uh, the Antichrist and from Armageddon and all of their enemies. Under number two then, Jesus predicts what the world will be like in the time of his exile. And so this time is, uh, and this description is called the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now we get this, if you go back to Matthew chapter 13, we'll spend the rest of our time there. And I don't think actually we need this anymore, so we'll turn that off. And if you look at Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. They said, why, why are you talking in parables? He says, I'm revealing things to you that you will understand. But because they don't really know, because they don't, they're not interested in understanding, they're not interested in believing, they're not interested in receiving the truth, then the parable, they won't understand. But, but what I'm trying to bring across to you, Jesus said, is that this is the mysteries of the kingdom. Now, we talked about this last time. Mysteries are something that are not revealed in the past. Now, you'll see that. We didn't read this before. But if you look over at verse 35... Um, verse 34, all these things speak Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable speak he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. This gap is not in the Old Testament. And that's why he says uh, in verse, uh, I think it's verse 15, um, no, I'm sorry, uh, verse 17, for verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, but have not seen them. So he, the Lord is revealing new information about this period of postponement, this gap, and he calls it the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And of course, this is something that is new, and he mentions that in verse 52. Uh, then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. Remember he talked about the wine skins. He says you can't take new wine and put it into old bottles. okay? Because uh, the wine would, um, as it matured, as the, 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 the fruit juice, the grape juice, it would, it would swell the... It's kind of like a skin on a bagpipe. You know, bagpipes are made of this, the bag and a bagpipe's made out of either horse hide or sheepskin. I've got a sheepskin on me. And so what happens is when, when uh, uh, 
the when when the the grape juice is in there that it will it will blow the bag up and stretches it um, and then they then they use it but if you but if you put new wine into an, an already stretched bag when it blows up even more it'll burst okay so you got to put new wine and new wine skins and see again what he's talking about is this is something new this is something that they didn't understand from the old testament this because of his rejection what he would how he would respond to that and there's parables like you know like the vineyard that uh, the the workers in the vineyard uh, they would not uh, uh, heed the servants of the master and then he sent his own son and he they killed his son and what will the master do he'll come and destroy those people and he will give the vineyard to those who will use it for good and that will bring forth fruit and he's speaking about how the program of God is now moving from the nation of Israel to this brand new time. Of course, the church is part of that. And that's not to negate the fact that God is still going to fulfill the promises to national Israel. Okay, so um, new, this new information, as we go back to Matthew 13, this new information that he predicts in this, this new time frame, uh, the new information comes in the form of seven parables. And we've listed them for you here. And over the next several weeks, we're going to go through this. Now, um, some of you already heard this teaching before, but this is actually very, very important. And some of it will really open your mind about the time in which we're living and, and how it actually affects the church here and our relationship with other churches and all kinds of uh, information is given to us in these parables that you'll find very, very interesting. Um, and what he's going to show you in these parables is the contrast between the, the kingdom proper when it comes and what it's like right now, because it's different. Um, the kingdom has been prophesied about, but this time has not been prophesied about. And so Jesus has given them information in these seven parables. The first parable is the parable of the sower. That's what we're going to look at tonight. And then the parable, and the next three are really amazing. The parable of the tares, the parable of the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven. And then the last three have to do with the right at the end of this period of time, right before his receiving by Israel. You have the parable of the hid treasure, the par parable of the pearl of great price, and the parable of the dragnet. Now, we have the interpretation of the parable of the sower. We have the interpretation by the Lord Jesus in the parable of the tares, but the rest of the parables he doesn't give an interpretation but what you have in the first two parables is kind of like a construct or how to it's a how to interpret parables as he interprets the first and second parables there's lessons in that that will help us to interpret the rest of the parables so that's going to be interesting when, when we get into that so these seven parables give us information about the time when the king is in exile. It's new information. And from the time of his rejection by Israel until his being received by them at the second coming. And a key feature of these predictions is the contrast between conditions during the exile of the king versus the promised kingdom that will be established in his presence. So there's going to be things that are new, things that are different, things that they didn't understand about this particular period of time. All right, well, let's look then at the first parable, the parable of the sower. Some people have called this the parable of the soils, but it really is the parable uh, of the sower because it's called that um, in verse 18. So if you'll look at your Bibles now, we're going to look first of all at the parable, and then we will look at the interpretation of it. So in verse 3 through 9, Jesus gives the first parable. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell upon or into good ground and, and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And that's always an encouragement, you know. He's hiding things from people with these parables, but he still invites them. If you've got ears, you can hear. In other words, if you want to know the truth, you will know the truth and you can know the truth. 
But if you're not interested, I'll be talking all day and you won't get a thing out of it. By the way, that's kind of like us. And we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit. But, you know, if you come to church and you're not of a mind to, to learn anything, you don't have ears to hear, you won't, you won't, you'll not get anything out of it. But if you come to church hungry, I don't care who the preacher is, you can leave with something. If he's opening the word of God, you leave with something. So he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, the key characteristic of this parable is the contrast, or the, and all of these have contrasts, all of these parables do. We'll talk about that as we go on. But the key characteristic in contrast here with this one, the parable of the sower, is the rejection of the word of God. In this period of time, as in, in contrast to the true kingdom that's coming, um, the word of God is going to be challenged. It's going to be in competition. It's, uh, there's going to be other forces that are going to challenge the word of God. And really, the characteristic of this parable is that the word of God is rejected for the most part. Now, the, the, there is good soil, thankfully. But for the most part, uh, the word of God is rejected. Now, in contrast to the kingdom, when the kingdom comes, how will the word of God be treated? What's it going to be like when Jesus comes and we're in the kingdom? He's on the throne in Jerusalem. Uh, what, what kind of weight will the word of God have? And what kind of influence will the word of God have upon the the whole inhabitants of the world. Well, let's look at some verses concerning this. Look at Isaiah chapter 2, first of all. Um, we might not look at all these, but let's look at some of them. Because when we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what the kingdom is. The kingdom is God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, which it's done in heaven perfectly, and so it would be done on earth perfectly. And so in the kingdom, the word of God has free reign. And there's no opposition to it whatsoever. Now, of course, there are rebels toward the end of that thousand-year period of time, but primarily through the most of the kingdom, um, the, the will of God is done perfectly. <clears throat> and so if you look at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3, um, it says, And many peoples will go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Now, that mountain is, is Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, where the temple will sit. And of course, there will be a temple during the tribulation period, but Jesus will also build a new temple according to Ezekiel chapter 40 and, and following. Uh, but here, these people are saying, let's go up to the mountain, let's go up to Jerusalem, let's go up to the, the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, not as prophets or as teachers or as pastors. He will teach us the Lord Jesus himself. He will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The word of God is very prevalent during the millennial kingdom. Look over chapter 11 uh, and verse number 9. They shall, not hurt in all, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth, now watch, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. People will know the Lord. They will know the word of the Lord. They will know their Bibles. Now, what about young children that are born? I, I said a thing a while ago. Maybe part of somebody's reward would be, I always picture this missionary that's got, he's been ministering for 40 years, backside of nowhere, and he's got maybe 10 people, you know. And his heart's desires that they reach, you know, millions, thousands, hundreds of thousands. And maybe the Lord takes him into the millennium kingdom and he, he gets all these, these young people, these these. Children have just been born or growing up. He said, now the Lord says, now I want you to go and I want you to teach them my word. And he has the privilege of opening the scripture with a captive audience, a willing audience to explain to them the word of God. What a wonderful reward certainly that would be. Then go to chapter 29 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 29, verse number 18. I love this one because this, this dovetails in with some of the other things. Verse 17 says, Is it not a very little while, and Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field? The fruitful field shall be esteemed as a forest. What he's saying there is there's going to be bumper harvest. A bumper harvest today is like nothing compared to this time. Then in verse 18, And in that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity, and out of darkness the, leap, the, the lame shall leap for joy. God, he's going to 
cure all illnesses. Because you've got people there in mortal bodies. That's where the children come from. And some of them will come um, actually maybe wounded, come, having survived the tribulation period. But he's going to heal them all, just like he did in his first coming. By the way, Jesus didn't heal everybody in the world when he came the first time. But he healed everybody that came to him, you know. Uh, but look at that a little bit. In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. What book, what book do you think it would be? The Bible. Because the word of God is so prevalent. Look over chapter 54 of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 54. In verse number 13. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. And so the word of the Lord is going to be very Prevalent. Look over at uh, Jeremiah chapter 31. This is the new covenant. And the new covenant, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. But the new covenant primarily, we always think of the, the word covenant is testament. This is where you get the, the term New Testament from. And it's in the Old Testament. And it primarily has to do with the nation of Israel. Behold, the day has come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. If you look down verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. What I'm saying is during the millennial kingdom, when the kingdom that Jesus brings comes, the word of God will have no competition whatsoever. None. No competition. There'll be no thorns. There'll be no uh, shallowness. Every heart will be open, receptive, and the word of God will germinate. But is that, is that the case now? No, no, it's not. Okay, so during the, during the exile of the king, the response to the word of God, unlike the kingdom, will be typified by rejection. So that's why we're coming to these four responses under number five. There are the four responses to the word of God. Response number one, hearers by the way say, verse number four, Behold, the sower went forth to sow, and, he, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Okay? Now, you, everybody knows what a sower is. You know, this is the old kind of sowing uh, with a bag and a hand, and you're throwing it out like this. Okay? Sometimes there's, you get these little contraptions that, that cast the seed out. But basically, you've got a sower. He's walking through the field. He's got a bag of grain, a bag of seed. He puts his hand in there, and he scatters the seed out. And of course, when you're scattering the seed like that, you know, um, it goes everywhere. And if you've, ever, if, you've ever, if you've ever seen a field in Israel, as far as maybe an, an undeveloped field, um, you're going to have rocky ground, sandy ground. You're going to have hard paths where people have been walking on. And then you're going to have fertile ground where seeds can go into. You'll have thorny ground. So he just throws it everywhere. He's not concerned where it's landing. It just goes everywhere. And so it, it lands on these four different types of soil. And the first soil here is by the wayside. He sowed seed, some seeds by the wayside. That means it's a path. People have been walking on that soil and it's compacted down. Uh, Brother Joel and I were out there today with the, uh, the skid steers and some of that, um, I moved the big pile of dirt and that was really, really compacted down underneath there. And we had to put that old bucket in and, and uh, give some horsepower to kind of break it up and, and to lift it out of there. Because when people walk or weight on it, it's going, the soil's going to get compacted. It's like a hard clay. When the sea goes on hard clay, it has nowhere to get in. There's no fissure, there's no crevice, there's no opening for the seed to get into the soil. In order for a seed to germinate, it has to be in the soil, not on top of it. It has to really to get in. And has to be able to put its root in. And when it's compacted and hard like that, it's not going to happen. And then it says, interestingly, that the fowls came and devoured them up. Now we're going to see how that ties in to some of the other parables later on. But basically, the, the seeds land on the ground, can't get in, it's not going to do any good. The birds come and they eat all the seed, take it away. Okay. Now if you look over at the interpretation of it, uh, there in verse number 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom... So the seed is the word of God. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away uh, that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the way, saying. So what this reveals is the seed is the word of God and the soil is a person's heart. 
And what kind of reception does the word of God get to this person? Well, this person's heart is hard. It's closed. For whatever reason, maybe lots of people walked on it or there's all kinds of bad experiences, but he maybe at one time was open, but now he's closed. His heart is hard. The word sown is unreceptive. It's unresponsive. It's an unbelieving soil and an unbelieving heart. And therefore, it will not be understood. It will not take root. It will not germinate. It will not bear fruit. And so, I don't know if you ever talked to somebody like this about with the gospel. And, you know, they're about ready to knock your teeth out. They would spit on you. Uh, they, they, they was, you know, I've, I could tell you lots of stories of someone who's been hard-hearted. I've preached to people who have been hard-hearted. And you may as well be talking to the wall. It's not going to do any good. So what happens when somebody responds to the word like that? He just invites Satan to come and steal away anything that was there. So there's no seed at all. There's no influence whatsoever. Look over at 2 Corinthians. Now this, this verse used to bother me. 2 Corinthians still bothers me, but not in the same way. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 4, a verse you, you know well, I'm sure, Verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, that's the small g, speaking about Satan, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So Satan is very, very active where the word of God is being sown. The word of God's not being sown. He's not really there. He's not really interested. But he is interested where the word of God is being sown. Do you think Satan is interested in a church like this and people like us? I think he really is, you know. Um, because we, we sow the word of God. And if it's sown in a hard heart and that, that person is unreceptive to the, to the word and he's hardened his heart, then Satan has, has an invitation to come and steal whatever is there. And it's completely gone. Now the thing used to bother me is that Satan is able to blind the minds of people so that the gospel can't get in. But I want you to notice the order here. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Can Satan blind your mind if you believe? Nope. It says that he's only able to blind the minds of them that believe not. Now who's responsible for believing or not believing? The person. So, you know, um, in a sense, this is a judgment because, and it's a danger when people are exposed to the word of God and they harden their heart and they say no to that, then Satan has an invitation to come in and blind their mind so that they, uh, and you know, hardening your heart is, is a, it's a process. It's kind of like when you hear the word of God and the first time. Uh, that's why children's ministry is so effective because they haven't really got to that place where they've hardened their hearts yet. For the most part, a child is open, childlike faith to believe the gospel. But what happens is through life is if they say no to the gospel and then they say no to the gospel, it's kind of like the skins of an onion. The Bible talks about our hearts being waxed fat. And it's kind of, you know, if um, he talks about circumcising your heart. You think of a heart and it's encased in fat and you try to take a pin and try to, you know, get through. It doesn't feel anything because it's got all these layers around it. And he says you've got to burr your heart so that your heart is sensitive to the truth. But people do that with their hearts. They, they put the skins of rejection and hardening their hearts to the point where it's insensitive. And nothing really gets through. And their minds are blinded to the gospel. And so this first response um, is one of hardness. And there are many hard people who refuse the gospel today. Now again, a question I would ask is, will Satan be around to do that when the kingdom comes? Well, according to Revelation chapter 20, he's bound that he deceived the nations no more till the thousand years are fulfilled. So when Jesus is ruling and reigning on the earth, there is no competition. Satan is not around. He's not able to come and steal the, the seed. He's not able to blind anybody's heart. He's not even able to deceive anybody because he's, he's in the bottomless pit. So this is new information. This is a new thing. This is a new aspect of 
the uh, information about the kingdom that is, that is different. All right, response number two then is the response of hearers in stony places in verse number five. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And then over in verse 20 and 21, but he that received, received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon, the word anon means like immediately or uh, quickly, uh, with joy, immediately with joy, he receives it. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when the tribulation, when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. So this is the uh, hearers in stony places. And this reveals a heart that has no root. So you got a little bit of soil on the top. And then underneath, uh, you know, you get this much soil, and then underneath is like stones and sand. So the sea goes in, goes in quickly, uh, puts uh, round, down roots through the soil, but it can't go any deeper because there really is no root. It's shallow. Everything's shallow. Now, the, the giveaway there in verse number 20 is that he uh, heareth the word and immediately with joy receives it. Now, I've been preaching the gospel for over 40 years, and I'm always very suspicious of when I give the gospel to somebody, and all of a sudden, boom, they love it. Fantastic. Yes, I want to be saved. And they're full of joy about it. Because the first response to the gospel really shouldn't be joy. It should be conviction. It should be contrition. It should be sorrow. It should be burden. It should be condemnation. You see, the gospel helps us to understand um, our need. And that's why in Romans, he spent two and a half chapters talking about condemnation before he got to the good bit in chapter 3, speaking about justification, because God has to, he has to teach us of our need. And the problem is, some people say, well, yeah, I want Jesus, and they have no, I, they have no concept of really what it means. And they're all excited that Jesus is going to be their helper or, or wherever, whatever it might be. But what happens when persecution comes along, you can't find them. And they're all excited about being saved. And they come to church for three weeks and then you can't find them anymore. And these are people who have no root in themselves, the Bible says. They have no root in themselves. They may have a root to the people that, in the church that they've been talking to and friends. They may have relationships, web relationships. They may have roots with the people. They may have roots with the church, but they don't have roots with the word and with the God of the word. See, if you really believe this, and persecution is never easy, but it does not change the root that is there that you have with the truth and with Christ. Salvation is a very personal thing. We get to enjoy it together, and it is obviously the church is God's community for us to experience that together. But you know what? If everybody in this church walked out, including me, and left you alone to stand for the truth of the gospel, you should be willing to do it. It should be that personal to you that, you know, you don't, you're not even maybe paying attention to what anybody else is doing. It's me and God and his message and getting the message out. And it doesn't really matter what anybody else is doing. And if I suffer persecution, then it's, it's between me and the Lord because I have a root. And if it's just a superficial thing, a shallow thing, it's not going to last. The third response is hearers among the thorns. In verse number seven, and some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Now the thorns weren't there when the seed went in. The, the thorns were seeds as well. And when the seed began to grow, then the thorns began to grow. And you know what it's like. Weeds are going to outgrow everything. And so what happens is that the true word gets choked out. And so the word has competition here. And if you look over at verse 23, but he that received good seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bring, I'm sorry, verse 22, he that received uh, seed among th the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becometh unfruitful, which is kind of interesting. Now, the, one of the other gospels says that it becomes unfruitful. But it says he becomes unfruitful, that the person, speaking about a person, that the person in his spiritual life gets choked out and he has no fruit. 
So this is one who is faced with a choice between the temporal and the eternal. The temporal are, are, the, are the thorns, the weeds that grow up and is choking the life out of the spiritual and the eternal. And so when he's faced with a choice between temporal and eternal, he chooses the temporal. Because the word gets choked out by the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. And the result is that he becometh unfruitful. Now, I, I forgot to ask that other question under number two there. Will there be tribulation or persecution during the kingdom? No. So there's no... In the kingdom, the word of God is preeminent and there's no challengers. And there is no persecution and there is no tribulation. And the same is true here with the thorns. In the absence of the king, there will be problems. While he's gone, there's problems here. There will be a struggle for the truth. Falsehood and lies will be our enemy. Um, but will there be curse of this world and the deceitfulness of riches during the kingdom? The answer is no. But here's where I want to kind of change the tack on this a wee bit. And if you read that center uh, paragraph under number three, we often think of these soils as unsaved people. And so these responses determine whether they get saved or remain lost. And is that true? Yes, it's true. But I want you to go further than that. And of course, that's true because this is the response to the word of God. But let me ask you something. As a Christian, do you think that these soils can also describe us? As a Christian, is there ever a time in your, in your Christian experience where whether you're coming to church or maybe you don't even open your Bible, but your heart becomes hard and God's trying to tell you something. Maybe you're coming to a church service and the preacher's preaching and God's trying to teach you something, trying to say something to you, but your heart is hard and the word doesn't get in and Satan comes and steals it away from you. Is that possible for a Christian? Because, you see, although this describes unsaved people, it's, it, that's not really what he's describing. He's describing the time in which we're living and the opposition to the word of God, which obviously unsaved people are susceptible to, but we are as well. Is there also a time, for, for example, for the believers where um, God is teaching us a certain truth, but we've got these conflicts because we have the deceitfulness of riches. We've got the curve of this world as a Christian, and it chokes out the spiritual life that God is trying to, uh, to bring in our lives. Can that also be true of us as believers? I think it can. And if you think of it that way, he's describing the time and how people receive the word of God, not just unsaved people, but even saved people. When you get to heaven, there's going to be, of course, your, your sin nature is going to be eradicated, which is going to be a happy day. We're looking forward to that. There's no competition at all, but in, in relationship to the word of God in heaven or in the kingdom, there, there is no competition. His will will be done perfectly, but that's not what it's like right now. And even as a Christian, the word of God can be challenged in our lives. The word of God can be rejected. In the Christian's life, our hearts can be hard. Our hearts can be shallow. Our hearts can be conflicted and um, with, with other things vying for our attention and our control. So I think that's an important thing. An important question for us is, you know, does the word of God have the authority and the obedience that it would have if we were already in heaven? Or do we wrestle with some stuff as well? Do we wrestle with the curse of this world? Do we wrestle with having a hard heart at times? And not able to receive? Well, the last response, number four, is hearers on good ground. Of course, this would be descriptive of saved people who receive the word of God. But in verse number eight, but other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some in hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And then over in verse 23, uh, but he that received seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understands it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So this soil, this fourth response, this good ground, this soil is not hard. It's broken. Break up the fallow ground. And you know, it's important for us as believers, even as believers, and we're all right, 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 I see it, but we need to have hearts that are able to receive with meekness the engrafted word. 
that our hearts are kind of loose and broken. They're not hard. But we keep ourselves tender and receptive. We come to church and say, you know, I don't really like him preaching, but I'll tell you what, Lord, I want, I want to hear something. So you open your heart and say, Lord, Ray, give me something. And you know what? If somebody comes to church with that attitude, you're going to get, you're going to get something. I remember I was, I was on deputation and I was with some older men and uh, I was in a church service on a Sunday morning and I had this young, young fellow was preaching and I have to tell you, he was, he was woeful. He was a terrible preacher. And we were at lunch and some of the old boys were kind of whispering, you know, and they were saying, what do you think of that? And they were all kind of bantering back and forth and oh, it was rubbish, you know, and this type of thing. But to be honest with you, I was, I mean, I was a young preacher, you know, and uh, my heart was very... I mean, I understand that he wasn't as, as polished as other preachers, but I, I was saying, Lord, teach me something. And, I, and they turned to me and they said, well, do you think? I said, well, I got a lot out of it. I got this and this and this and this. I said, I got a lot out of it. They didn't get anything out of it. But if, you, if, you're, if you're going hungry, um, you know, the, the full soul, um, you know, honeycomb is a repulsion, and any kind of the sweetest and the best of foods will be repulsive to someone who is full. But you take somebody who's really, really hungry, and they'll go for a scrap of bread. There's a scrap of bread to be had if you're hungry enough, you'll eat it. Right. It's all about our attitude. So the soil is not hard; it's not shallow. There's some depth there. It has no competition from the thorns. There's here's someone who has cleared the path and said, you know what, Lord, I've already decided I'm not going this, that these things have no value for me. I'm after the eternal things, not the temporal things. And Lord, I'm open, I'm, I'm receptive, I'm listening, I'm re I want what you have for me. And so then the Lord sows the, the seed. And the seed then falls into it. It's interesting that he says, I, I misread it at the beginning, verse 8, but other fell, I started to say, but other fell among. But it doesn't say among, it says, but other fell into good ground. The seed has to get into you. And you have to let it get into you. You know, and that, you know to some extent, that's, I mean, just things are coming to my mind. If you're, if you're coming to church, if you're a member in the church, you should have at least um, some modicum of um, respect for the pastor. Because that's the way you're going to receive the seed into you. If, if, you, if you're a member in the church and you just hate the pastor, you just can't abide him. It may be his personality. And, you know, everybody's different, you know. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, you know. And I'm wondering why everybody doesn't love me. But you know what? Time has taught me that's just the reality of life is not everybody's going to like you. But the point is, if I was in a, a member in the church and I hated the pastor, I wouldn't stay. Because that relationship is going to stop me from receiving what God has for me. I would go and find a, a pastor that I'd respect for to some extent, you know, um, so that it wouldn't hinder me receiving the message. Because if you're going there, all right, go ahead. Try to bless me today. He has no chance. And you have no chance. And that's really not the way it's supposed to be. And so we have to be receptive. And so our hearts are broken up. We're receptive. The seed falls into our heart. The word is heard, the word is received, the word is understood, the word is germinated, and guess what? It brings forth fruit. And so life happens. So when the word of God gets into a receptive heart, something happens. Life happens. It grows. And then there's fruit that comes. Now the fruit is different for every person. Different yields, hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. It's the same thing with uh, the, 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 the talents. Some gets five talents, two talents, one talent. Um, you know, we're not all ta ten talent Christians. Everybody's completely different. And God doesn't expect a two talent Christian to put out what a ten talent, what he expects out of a ten talent person. But God expects out of us what we're capable of. And so for some of us, it may be a hundredfold. Some of us, it may be sixtyfold. And if you've got 30 full and you're looking at a guy that's got 100 full and you're beating yourself up over it, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And he may be, uh, uh, he may be, uh, uh, he may be a, uh, a 60 full Christian and, and he's looking at a 30 full Christian and he says, well, I'm doing better than, than they are. But maybe, maybe he's only got 40, you know, maybe he's only, he, his, his gain, his, his yield is only 40 when it should be 60, but it's more than 30. You can't compare, you see, because we're all different. 
And so what we find here is this, of course, is those who hear the gospel and their hearts are tender and they receive it. It's not shallow. It's not crowded out with other things. It takes root and salvation truly occurs. And then it changes our life and fruit uh, marks us as a believer. But I want you to notice the conclusion here. How do you respond to the word of God in your life? Because again, we always interpret this concerning the four responses to the gospel. Uh, those, you know, the first three are not saved. Um, possibly the third one is saved, but it doesn't bear any fruit. Um, and then the fourth one is genuinely saved. But maybe the this the, the teaching that the Lord is giving here is not really not really about being saved. It's really about the Word of God and the different receptions to the Word of God. And that, of course, involves lost people, but it also involves us. And, uh, you know, what I say here, does the Word of God have competition in your life? When the kingdom comes, God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There will be no competition, no distraction, no opposition to the Word of God. But what about now? Do you, ever, do you ever find that there's a tension there? That there's a, you know, that, that some, some, sometimes uh, you hear something the Bible clearly teaches, but you're not kind of on board with it? Does the Bible always win in your life? Now, there's going to come a time when it will. But right now, I think we have to understand that there's the possibility that we can have a hard heart. Or a shallow understanding. That we're not really interested in learning and understanding it. Or that we're looking at the wrong things. We're looking at temporal things instead of eternal things. And those storms and the curves of this world are choking out spiritual life in our life as a Christian. Or if we understand these things, maybe it would help us to say, you know what? Every time I hear the Bible, is really, really it's very dangerous. One of the most dangerous things you can do is listen to the Word of God because if you don't respond in the right way to that, see, you're going to respond one or two ways. When you hear the Word of God, you're going to respond to it in such a way where you're opening your heart, you're receiving it, you're understanding it, it's going to germinate, it's going to bear fruit, or you're going to, close, you're going to cut it off, you're going to harden your heart. And I will tell you, churches are filled with Christians that have hard hearts. Sometimes I'll preach a message and, uh, you know, not every sermon I preach will maybe affect me the way it, maybe it should. But sometimes I'll preach a message and it really, really affected me. You know, maybe it's, I mean, even last Sunday I was, I was thinking about the glory and, and the joy and all of that. And I was kind of excited. And then you see somebody in church and they're going out the door and it's kind of like, you know, were you here? Did you actually hear that? Because they go out like, they didn't hear it. And I think that's true. And that can be true for me. That can be true for a preacher. A preacher can preach a Bible message and harden his heart to the truth of it. And that's where the Bible talks about beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, We're going to, which is another of the parable, the parable of the leaven, which is hypocrisy. And so, does the Bible always win in your life? Even when challenged by persecution or curse or distractions, is God's will being obeyed now as it will be then? Or do we have hard hearts, distracted hearts, conflicted hearts at times when we hear the word of God? It's a good question, isn't it? So we can't just say, well, that's just about the lost people. No, it's about the word and how the word is received or not received right now when the king's not here. The king is in exile. He's coming. It's going to be different when he comes. But we've got to be very careful about what we do right now with his word. And we need to make sure that our hearts are tender and open and receptive. Dear Father, thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the king of kings, your son, our Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray in our hearts, even so come Lord Jesus. We've prayed that ever since we got saved. But Lord, the older we get, the more ready we are. We, we long for you. We look for you. We love you. We love your appearing. And Lord Jesus, we know that things are going to get very much different for us, for the world, the planet, when you come and establish your kingdom. We are so grateful, Lord, 
for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that we are your children and that, Lord, that we belong with you. But, Lord, help us to learn from this lesson tonight. In fact, Lord, help us not to harden our hearts about what we have heard tonight. Help us to open our hearts and be receptive to the fact that sometimes our response to your word is not really what you would want it to be. And Lord, challenge us about that. And when we come to church, help us to come in the spirit of worship, seeking God, seeking you, Lord. And whether it's a song or a message or a scripture reading, uh, Lord, that we would be thirsty and hungry to hear from you. And Lord, then that we will hear. He that hath ears, let him hear. And help us to be receptive to your word. And Lord, may it change us. May it bring forth fruit. And may we be involved with the Bible, involved with the sermons, involved with the messages that, that we walk out of here different than we were when we came in. And Lord, help us and teach us. And Lord, thank you that we belong to you tonight. Bless your people. Those who are at home tonight, those who are sick, those who are here, thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.